When our granddaughter was a little girl, about three years old, maybe four years old, she would uh, pray with us every night. We would go in and pray with her every night before we put her down in her, probably not her crib by then, probably her little bed she had. And she would always pray for the good things that she knew in her life. She would say, thank you, Jesus, for my mommy and daddy. Thank you, Jesus, for my grandma and my grandpa. Thank you, Jesus, for my dog, Max, even though he drooled all over her most of the time. <laughs> thank you for my toys, and thank you for Tigger. And Tigger was that stuffed doll, stuffed tiger. She carried that around with her wherever she went. And after giving thanks for all of these things, and her head still bowed and her hands still folded, and she would sit there for a moment and she'd say, Jesus, with sprinkles on the top, amen. And it always made me smile when she said, when, with sprinkles on the top, amen, because she was done and she couldn't think of any more good things to say. So she left it up to Jesus to decide what the good things were. With sprinkles on the top, give me the good things. And I began to wonder at that time, this is probably, I don't know now, maybe nine, ten years ago. Yeah, nine, nine ten years ago. How do we get the sprinkles on the top? How do we say thank you, Jesus, and just sit there for a minute and say, with the sprinkles on the top? And I think I found my answer, or I did find my answer, in the book of James. And it started in chapter 5, and it begins with verse 16. And here's what it says. James tells us, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you will be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain, on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. James started by telling us, let's look looking at a James 5, 16a. The first thing he told us about prayer, he said, was confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that we may be healed. And so the first thing I see in that verse is it's very, very important for us to go before God in prayer, in submission, and go with a repentive heart. We should go before him and make sure all of our sins have been confessed and, and that we're trying to repent from them. It won't be, it won't be, diff, it won't be hard. It won't, I mean, it won't be easy. It'll be hard because we still continue to sin, but we should at least bring those sins up and say, God, I know that you can help me. I know that you can cover those sins in the blood of Jesus. And it's unsure here if he's talking about spiritual healing or physical healing, so I consider it that he means both. He means come before God, confess your sins in prayer, and you'll receive both physical healing and spiritual healing. The second part of that verse in, in 16b says this. It says, the effective prayer of a righteous person is powerful and can accomplish much. Now, the translation of that really means the effective word in the Greek means in prayer. And then prayer means prayer. So it's kind of like a Hebraism where you say, in prayer, pray. But what it really means is it's putting the emphasis on it, and it really means in a bowing situation where you bow down to God like you would, like, like, like Riley did when she bowed her head and, and, and clasped her hands. Pray fervently and pray in submission. So that's what it means. And the question is that I have is about our righteousness. Because for a long time, I didn't think I was righteous enough. When I started this lesson 12 years ago or 9 or 10 years ago, at the time, I sometimes didn't feel like I was righteous enough. It wasn't my demeanor. I went to him in, in submission, and I went to him in fervently in prayer. But I felt something lacking because I didn't feel I was righteous enough. Have you ever felt that way? I felt like I'm still a sinner. And I had to understand that no one is righteous on their own merits. Once I started reading my Bible more and understanding it more, I discovered that no one is righteous on our own merits. We're only righteous in our faith to Jesus Christ and by God's grace. That's what calls us righteous. It's not what we do. It's not what we do did. It's not what we do. It's not what we can do. It's what we did. We believed in Jesus Christ and God accredited us his righteousness. I think in the book of Abraham, it tells us that that's how Abraham was saved. In James 2.23, James went back a couple verses, a couple chapters, and he said, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. 
So once he believed in God and once we believe in Jesus, we're righteous. So when we pray, then we should draw near God on the basis of his worthiness and on the merits of Jesus Christ and not on anything that we can do. It says again, the effective prayer of a righteous person is powerful and can accomplish much. And I like that word much here. Much is a really great word, isn't it? Prayer can, can, can affect much. What does much mean? Anything you want it to mean, right? It doesn't pinpoint anything specifically, nor does it take away from anything. It doesn't preclude anything either. It just says prayer can afford us much. And so what that means is prayer and what it can afford us is up to us and our imagination and his will. In other words, we can pray for everything. We don't have to pray in a regimental prayer and, and, and it's all laid out for us like this. We can just pray. Matter of fact, in, in verses, God says, don't babble in your prayer like the heathens do. Basically, just tell me what you want and I'm listening. Psalms 81.10, I love this verse. Here's what the Lord says is about prayer. He says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Isn't that a great way to put it? Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Tell me what you need and pray in a way that allows me to fill that. It doesn't measure our prayers. He doesn't judge our prayers. He doesn't give us style on length or syntax or we're not judged on performance. We're judged on our righteousness. We're judged in our faith that we have in his son, Jesus Christ. Prayer isn't like, you know, begging, like, you know, here, 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 sit up, sit up, here, pray. I got a treat for you. It's not like that at all. It's not, we're not begging him for anything. We're going to him in a conversation. And he deems us righteous, and so he will listen and hear our prayer. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard wickedness in, in anyone's heart, the Lord will not hear it. And so we have to be careful that he doesn't regard any wickedness in our heart. The funny thing is, though, it's the next verse. It's, it comes in John 7, uh, James 5, 17, 18. James is talking to us about prayer, and we understand what he said so far, and it seems to make a lot of sense, and that's the way we should pray. And then all of a sudden he brings up Elijah. Out of nowhere, this man Elijah appears in our prayers, and Elijah, of course, as you know, was a prophet, and Elijah died, well, he didn't die, he went up to heaven in a chariot, flaming chariot, about 930 years before this was written, 940, 950 years before this was written. And so James is talking to us about prayer, and he goes back and he talks to us about Elijah. And so we got to find the connection. There's somewhere there's a connection between prayer and a connection between Elijah. And if we can find that connection, we should be able to tell how to get the sprinkles on the top. So let's look at that and see what we can find. 1718 says, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed, see that? He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. And we don't find that in, in the story of Elijah. We won't find that, that the word he prayed. So we have to keep that in mind, that this is, this is that Elijah did, he prayed. So Elijah goes to God, he asked for sprinkles on the top, and he prayed, and, he, and then he appears before King Ahab. Have you heard of King Ahab? He was a northern king of the northern, northern tribes of Israel. Not a good king. Matter of fact, he was a terrible king. He married a lady named Jezebel, remember that? And Jezebel killed a lot of the God, prophets of God, and she brought her own prophets in who worship Baal, B-A-A-L. That was the god of fertility. And she brought her prophets in and they worshiped this other god. And so she brought false gods and the worship of false gods to the people. He was the god of, uh, of uh, fertility. And the nation of Israel turned their backs on the one true God. And when Elijah heard about it, he came and he confronted King Ahab about it. And he went in and he said, until the people change their ways, it will not rain again. Until they turn back to God, it will not rain. Look at 1 Kings 17. It says, now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord and God of Israel lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these three years, except by my word. Do you know what a Tishbite is? Have you ever had one? It's very painful, leaves a rash. <laughs> Notice there's something missing in those verses. Well, I mentioned prayer, right? 
There's, it doesn't mention a thing about prayer, but we get this from James. James just told us earlier that he prayed and then the rain stopped. So again, James brought him up in his discussion earlier to make sure that we knew that he prayed and that's what caused the rain to stop. Deuteronomy 11, 16, 17 says this. It says, beware that your hearts are not deceived and that you do not turn away and serve other gods and worship them. Or the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens. See that? So there is no rain and the ground will not yield its fruit and you will perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. This is the best part of all of this. We find, that we find out what the answer is. What did he pray? He prayed the word of God. You see that? He prayed the scripture. Elijah knew the Bible. He had studied the Bible. He had read this Bible. He was a prophet of God. He knew God's will and he knew God's word. And so all he did was go back to a verse in Deuteronomy that I just read. Verse 17, or the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain on the ground. And he knew that. And so he walked in boldly into King Ahab and he said, here's the deal. If you don't, like he prayed first, and he said, if you don't turn back to God, then I declare the rain will stop. Did God answer his prayer? Yes. Why? Because he was talking back, he was telling God exactly what he said. He was praying the scripture. All he was doing was praying God's will. And by praying God's will, God answered his prayer. And then this drought was a direct challenge, of course, to all of the people naturally, naturally, and it was especially a challenge to the worshipers of this God Baal because they were asking and praying and, and, and pleading for him to send them rain for three and a half years, and it never came. For three and a half years, the people suffered under this oppression because of this prayer and because God was punishing them, and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed to their God, but they prayed to the wrong God, and there was no, no answer. So once more Elijah came to the people and this time he said in 1 Kings 18, he said, how long will you hesitate between these two options? How long will you hesitate? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, if Baal is God, follow him. And look at the people didn't answer. How long will you hesitate? All you have to do is turn back to God and this will end. He said in, he said in, in, this, in his scripture, when you turn your backs away from God, the rain will stop. Meaning if you turn your backs to God, or you turn back to God, the rain will begin again. So finally, Elijah said, well, I'm gonna settle this once and for all. We're just gonna settle this right now. He said to, to the prophets of uh, Baal, he said, send all your prophets to me on Mount Carmel and send all the people to me. I wanna gather all the people together and all the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And there was a multitude of people there. And he said, bring me two oxen and cut the oxen up. And he said, lay the oxen on wood, but don't light the fire. Do this on this side over here. Lay the oxen on wood over here and don't light the fire. Lay an oxen over here on this wood and don't light the fire. And he said, we'll know who the one true God is after this. And Elijah said, go first. You guys go first. And he said to the prophets, ask your God to bring down fire onto this sacrifice. You guys go first. I'll just sit over here and wait. So he goes over in the corner and he stands and these guys go crazy. They flail their arms and they dance and they holler and they yell and they scream and they plead and they're on their knees. All the things we don't have to do when we pray. All the things that we don't have to do is make it a big show and plead your case and all that. God knows what we need. He knows what we want and he'll be there for us. But they continued and they continued. And finally around noon, Elijah began to mock them. And he started saying little things. Is he listening? Nothing happened. They just went further. They cut themselves with knives and they started to bleed. And they again jumped up and down. Maybe he can't hear you. Maybe he's hard of hearing. Nothing. Is he sleeping? Nothing. And finally, and this is in the translation, he said, are they indisposed? Which means, are they on the toilet? That's exactly what it means in the translation. And so they cut themselves even more to the point where there was blood flowing all over the place and all over the sacrifice. And then late in the afternoon, Elijah came to the temple or to the uh, uh, altar and he repaired the altar. They had torn the altar down. So he picked up the stones and he repaired the altar. 
he put some fire around the wood around it. He put uh, some, some of the slaughter on the top of it, some of the meat on the top of it. He dug a trench all around it, a deep trench. And so he said, soak the entire sacrifice down with water. Go get buckets of water. And so they got buckets of water and they soaked the sacrifice. I like bucket after bucket after bucket. We pick up the story in 1 Kings 18. Here's what it says. He said, soak it. Then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. Then he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar. He also filled the trench with water. So now this gets soaked down the altar, the meat soaked down, the wood soaked down, and there's water all around in the trench, deep water in the trench. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and he said, O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, Today, let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. See that? At your word. I have done all of these things because I've prayed to you before and used your own words. O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned and that, that you have turned their heart back again. That was the key to it, wasn't it? You promised when they turned back to you that you would bring the rain. See what he's doing now? He reminded God that he would stop the rain when the people weren't turned toward him, but now he's reminding him that he said he would start the rain when they did. Verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the woods and the stones and the dust. It consumed everything and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Elijah prayed the word of God. He prayed the scriptures and he said, I have done everything that you have asked me to do and I've done everything that you have told me to do in your word. Look at this 1836 again, this is important. O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. And we're going to talk about that in a minute here. So the key to effective praying then, as we see from this example that James gave us, is praying the word of God. It's praying the scriptures. And fire came down from heaven. And Elijah's prayers were answered because he spoke boldly God's word in faith and he submitted to him. And that's the key, praying God's word. Notice the difference I said before, the heathens danced and they yelled and they flailed their arms and they did everything. Elijah simply stood up. He simply stood up, he unfolded his arms and stood up and he said, look, Lord, your people have turned their backs to, have turned back to you. Your people are turning or will turn back to you. Do what you promised and return the rain and return the rain. And this was accomplished by one righteous man. It wasn't accomplished by 20 or 30 or 40 prophets of Baal jumping up around. It was just accomplished by one righteous man, by one righteous person like you and I in prayer. So I guess the answer, or the, que the, answer or the question is here is how, how do we pray God's word? Well, the first thing we pray God's word, the first way to do it is we need to know our Bible, don't we? We need to read, we need to study, and we need to learn. If we know what he's telling us in this book, we can pray what's in this book. Wednesday evening, I was thinking of this as uh, Pastor Jim. He had a Bible study. If you missed it here Wednesday evening, it was very, very good. Jim is talking about the relevance of Jesus, and he's introducing us to Jesus, and he's telling us all of these things that we know, but we kind of just put aside. If you were here, if you remember, he talked to us about the names of Jesus, the names of God. And I started thinking about it. And he started saying, matter of fact, I got my notes right here. He started saying, God is wonderful. Uh, he's a counselor. His words are, and his miracles are wonderful. He understands. He's compassionate. He's wisdom. And we say that often, but we don't really think about it, do we? We just say God's compassionate, God's wisdom. But when you study it like this and start thinking about it, it really starts to stick in these names and what God calls himself. The Bible tells us that his name, the first thing we learned is his name is wonderful. And it said the words, his words and his miracles are also wonderful. So how would you pray that? How would you pray that? How would you pray the scripture? Jesus, you're wonderful. Your word is wonderful. We are told that in both the book of Luke and in the book of Matthew. And I need that now. 
I need your wonderful word and I need your wonderful word, miracles. I need a miracle in my life right now, Jesus. You said they are wonderful and you said if I prayed to you that you would give me and you would afford me that miracle. I need a miracle. That's what I need right now. You are wonderful, God. You have promised me this. But you don't pray it just out of here. You pray it from here too. You pray it in submission. You don't pray it just from the head or from the mouth. You pray it from the heart. You pray it from the soul. You are wonderful. Let me feel your wonder. Let me feel your miracles. Guide me. Lead me. Tell me what to do. Show me where to go. You are wonderful. I know I'm a sinner, but I also know that you send grace. And when I was praying that, you're wonderful, I felt the spirit quicken inside me. I could feel it. I could feel the spirit just go, yes, he is wonderful. So let me answer, let me ask you a question, I guess I should say. Let me ask you a question. Would God answer a prayer like that? Pretty good chance, right? Jim spoke of miracles. He spoke of getting the sprinkles on the top. That's what he was saying. Miracles are wonderful. God will give us the sprinkles on the top. Send us your miracles. We also learned that he was a counselor. How often have you needed a good counselor? They're hard to find today sometimes, aren't they? And they're quite expensive. But we have one that lives inside of us. You are a counselor, we learn. God, you're my counselor. I need you. I don't know what to do. I'm lost. I don't have a clue where to turn. There's no place for me to go. I need you, and I need you right now. I need you to help me. I need your counseling. I need your wonderful counseling. I need you to direct me in my life. Do you think he'd answer that prayer? Why not? Right? We learned he was compassionate. We learned he understands. We learned he was full of wisdom, almighty, everlasting, prince of peace, eternal, internal, and conditional. In that one hour lesson, we learned all of these things that would just help us so much in our prayer lives if we knew them and understood them. Like I said, I kept my notes right here so I can look at them during the week. They're on the top of my Bible. And now I can pray them this all this week. I can pray those notes. Father, you are everlasting. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you. I am everlasting too because of you. I'm everlasting. Thank you, Father. Thank you for that. As an everlasting God, Please direct me in this life, but also fill me with your word in this life and also in the next life. Because I always know, I always want your word. I never want to be parted from that word. So teach me, learn me, direct me with your word now, but also fill me with it in the world to come. Look at that Deuteronomy 11, 16, 17 one more time. Beware that your hearts are not deceived and that you do not turn away and serve other gods and worship them. Or the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heaven so that there will be no rain and the ground will not yield its fruit and you will perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. How did he dare to walk into King Ahab and tell him that? If you don't turn your back, if you don't turn back to the people, the people back to God, to Jesus, if you people don't follow Jesus Christ, on my word, it's not going to rain. How did he dare say that? because it was God's word. It was God's word, it wasn't his word. This evening when you pick up your Bible, try it. You'll always find something that you can pray about. The word will guide you, it will bring forth truth, it'll give you peace, it'll bring you comfort. The word of God creates shock and awe, miracles, and that's what you can have if you pray the right way, if you pray the word of God. Has your devotion slacked off a little bit? Maybe not as good as your Bible reading kind of. How many times do you just read the Bible? Blah, 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 blah. I do. I used to. Blah, 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 blah. Devotion over. Why don't you pray it? Pray your devotion. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, oh, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you. See how much you'll get out of the Bible if you study every word and find out everything that he is and has to offer. We have his model, we have his plan, and now we have what we need to succeed. We talked about it, right? We talked about the model for his church, what he wants his church to offer and have. We talked about the plan on how we can get there. The prayer is what? How we stay there. Pray, 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 pray. Monday, tomorrow, we'll study the book of Revelation at 10 o'clock in the morning. You can come and pray during that study too. You'll find a lot to pray about there. 
Wednesday at 6 p.m. we have another study Jim's putting on about Jesus and who he is and how relevant he is. Last week we looked at his names and this week we're going to look at his identity. Another note full of, another sheet full of notes that we can pray on. Next Sunday at 9.30 we have a Bible study here in the morning. It's either led by, uh, by Daryl or where's Russ? By Russ. And you can pray during that Bible study. And then during the message too you can pray. If you hear something that I speak of during the message and it touches you, stop and say a prayer. You don't have to listen to me all the time. Stop and say a prayer. Sound good? You too can receive the sprinkles on the top. 